And thanks, Greg, for always for that great uh, time of worship. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> yes, and uh, this Friday we'll be having our annual Evidence and Answers Banquet at the Honolulu Country Club, so come join us if you can. Meet the entire Evidence and Answers community. We'll be having over 200 people there, supporters, friends, and uh, just a great time of celebration of all that uh, God has done and is doing with Evidence and Answers. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll hear some powerful testimonies, some of the highlights of this past year, uh, some ins an inspiring message by the president of the Hawaii Billy Graham Association. So it's just going to be a great and really fun time together. It's, uh, and our Japan tour is sold out, so uh, come join us next time, all right? Uh, every year we go on an annual, well, almost every year, we go on an annual Japan Christian Martyrs Tour. A lot of people don't know that Japan has a Christian history older than ours, and thousands, thousands of Japanese gave their lives for Christ during the great, uh, one of the greatest massacres in the history of the church between 16 to 1800. Uh, and we'll also be in Israel okay, next year. And uh, some of you may know Junko. She's award-winning Christian songwriter will be doing worship on our, leading worship on our tour along with a couple other partner churches there in California. So it's going to be a really uh, fun time. We're also going to be going into Jordan. So come join us uh, next year if you can. All right. And um, let's see, did I miss? Where's our? There we go. Uh, everything we're talking about today, and, and a lot of you guys asked me about last week's message. You can get it all here on our website, evidenceandanswers.org. Hope many of you have a chance to listen to our radio show. It's on every day, Monday through Saturday. Monday through Fridays, it's 6 p.m. on KGU there. It's a nationally syndicated show, but also internationally syndicated. We're on the number one talk show there in the Philippines, something that we're really excited about uh, out there in the Philippines, and uh, since I won't see you again until probably next year, you know, I just wanted to uh, let you, uh, you know, thank many of you for those of you who pray and are part of the Evidence and Answers community and be doing some great things uh, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, so next time I see you, I have some more exciting things to report. We just got picked up by the biggest uh, Christian publisher out there in the Philippines, so our books uh, we'll be going out there all over the Philippines. Uh, DZAS has almost finished reaching the entire main island of Luzon. So every week, literally millions are listening to Evidence and Answers and uh, hearing the life-impacting message of Christ there. And next year, we're going to have our first annual ever Evidence and Answers conference there at Green Hills Christian Fellowship, one of the major churches there in the Philippines a congregation of over 30,000, and if you throw in Southeast Asia and Canada and all the churches they're in, uh, it's going to be a great uh, conference. So those are some of the things going on with Evidence and Answers. I want to thank you all for being a part of it, many of you who pray for us and support us. So hopefully when I see you again next year, we're going to have some exciting things to report as together, right? We are impacting and uh, touching lives for Christ around the world. Well, as we begin then, let's pray. Father, we pray you would speak through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I gave Tim a couple, Pastor Tim, a couple of topics to choose from, and he uh, wanted me to speak on this one. And, you know, there are certain topics that we always try to avoid in a conversation, right? <laughs> Those are politics and religion. But that's what we're talking about today. And one of the struggles the Christian faces is this, that as Christians, we are citizens of heaven, primarily, but we are also citizens of the country in which we reside, where we are called to be salt and light by God to the culture and the world around us. And so what is the relationship between Christianity and politics, or my faith and political involvement. Now, <clears throat> there have been two extreme positions here, unfortunately, held by Christians. 
Some Christians believe they are citizens of heaven and the world is going to get worse till Christ returns. And so they do not vote or participate or involved in any way in civil affairs. To the other extreme, there are some Christians who believe that government is the answer and therefore Christianity becomes some kind of political movement. Okay? However, this view forgets to account for the sinfulness of man and the shortfalls of human government. So I hope today to present what is a balanced biblical view okay, between faith and politics. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about government and political science. Uh, I touched briefly on it last week. And if you know the Founding Fathers, if you listen to our shows on uh, Evidence and Answers with Oz Guinness and Rick Green and uh, Richard Land and many others, experts in these arenas, you'll understand that our Founding Fathers built our unique form of government on biblical principles. That is completely undeniable, although there are many that deny that premise today. It's just undeniable. But what, what are we called to do as Christians, and what is our relationship to government? Well, Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, is one of the passages, <laughs> one of the many passages that speak on the Christian's responsibility to government. <clears throat> and in verses 1 through 3, it says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, <laughs> and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. The first duty of the Christian is to submit to the government authorities. <laughs> now, the word submit there means to place oneself under. Christians should submit to the government because, it says, God establishes the governmental authorities. See, the institution of government was created by God all the way back in Genesis chapter 9 in order to maintain a okay, public order. Oh, thanks, Kevin. In order to uh, maintain order in society. There's several institutions which God has created. One is the family. One is the church. One is government okay, that God instituted. Wherever people are gathered, you need a form of government to maintain order. Your church here has a form of leadership or government. Government <clears throat> is it, was established by God. Okay? And it's God's way of maintaining order in society, all the way back in Genesis chapter 9. So as Paul says, an individual who rebels is rebelling against what God has established and ends up bringing judgment upon themselves. Now remember, when Paul was writing this, who was the emperor of Rome? It was Nero, all right? one of the worst and most corrupt emperors in the Roman Empire. And in most cases, okay, we're speaking in general, generalities here, in most cases, those who do right need not fear the authorities. And Christians should be outstanding citizens. We should be known for being outstanding citizens in our nation. Our ultimate allegiance is to God and his words. And if the demands of government violate the laws of God, then the Christian must obey the higher law, right? As Peter said in Acts, we must obey God rather than men when there is a violation of God's law. If there, if there are unjust laws, then we exhaust all legal means possible and civil disobedience must be done, <clears throat> must be taken seriously and not in a very cavalier fashion. So Christians should seek first to be some of the best citizens of the country that they live in. Great early American statesman and orator 
Daniel Webster once stated that whatever makes men good Christians makes them good citizens. Unfortunately, today, the culture views us evangelicals often you know, as uh, a, a threat or sometimes a nuisance. We're known for protesting a lot of things and what we are opposed to, but we should be known first and foremost for being model citizens in our country. We should be known for our love of all men, a love for truth, love for justice, to love even those who disagree with our message. Then when we need to speak out, people understand that our cause is just, but motivated by our love for people and our country. You know, some of the best examples of uh, model leadership come from the New Testament and from early church history. The most powerful example in history of a good citizen, of course, is Jesus Christ. He fully understood God's will. He fully understood God's will. He was able to discern perfectly when he should submit to human government and when he should challenge it. Jesus was known for challenging the religious authorities of his day. Yet knowing full well, he was on his way to the cross when he was brought before Pontius Pilate. Jesus looked at him and said, You would have no power over me at all unless it were given to you from above. John chapter 19. And he, was, and he willingly submitted to that imperfect government, fulfilling uh, God's will and prophecy, and through his death offered salvation to all of mankind. Now, the early church fathers also modeled the same thing as Christ. Justin Martyr, the first great apologist of the church in the second century AD, he was a former pagan worshiper, came to Christ, and in his first apology or defense, he challenged the Romans who were accusing the Christians okay, of all kinds of false and wicked accusations. But he challenged the Roman government to investigate rumors of Christian misbehavior. And he reiterated the teachings of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 22 regarding paying taxes, as well as noting how Christians pray for the emperor and their leaders. And he said, if you investigate the Christians, they would be found to be moral, upright, and law-abiding citizens who are the emperor, empire's best allies in securing good order. Irenaeus is the spiritual grandchild of the Apostle John. <clears throat> and he stated, quoting Romans chapter 13 in his work against heresies, he said, Earthly rule, therefore, has been appointed by God for the benefit of nations and not by the devil, who's never at rest at all but that by means of the establishment of laws, they may keep down an excess of wickedness among the nations. They are God's ministers serving for this very purpose. So as Christians, we should be model citizens who fulfill our duties as citizens of the United States so that when it is our time to speak out against an unjust law, <clears throat> people will have our ear and understand what motivates us. You know, one of the sad things is that uh, voter participation among evangelicals is some of you know, the worst in our nation. I was speaking with Sharon Har. She's a great sister in the Lord, congresswoman representing the west side of the island, Eva Beach. Uh, a courageous woman who stands for biblical principles in our political arena. And one of the things that broke her heart is that over 10,000 Christians showed up at court, uh, showed up at the state legislature to protest uh, same-sex marriage. However, over a third were not even registered to vote. So when their names come up on the computer, everyone in the legislature can see who's talking and it sees immediately whether they're registered to vote or not. And if they're not registered, really no one's listening. And it was sad to hear over a third of the Christians that showed up weren't even registered 
uh, to vote there. So one of the duties as Christians is we should be model citizens obeying the just laws of our land, fulfilling our roles as United States citizens. That's one of the first principles of believers is to submit to the governing authorities. They are indeed established by God. The second principle is to understand the primary role of government. Primary role of government, according to Romans, is this. For the government is God's servant for good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Government's role is to promote justice and to stand against evil. The civil leader is God's servant for the benefit of society. They are God's servants and their duty is to enforce justice okay, and judge evil. God has given authority to government, not to the church, but to government to use force to promote justice and to stand against evil. <clears throat> That's why Paul says here, for he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Verse 4, he says, for he does not bear the sword in vain. The ability, capital punishment there. <clears throat> the authority to take life okay, when one has committed great acts of evil or in defense of the nation comes uh, that authority is given by God to a just government. So government is given the authority to use force when necessary to promote justice and to stand against evil. And there cannot be freedom without justice and just laws. <clears throat> and a society without just laws is a society that is in bondage to tyrannical rule or moral anarchy. But you cannot have just laws <clears throat> unless you're built upon a foundation of truth. You cannot have truth unless it's based on its source. Truth originates with God. Our founding fathers understood this principle. It's written all throughout their works. Listen to many of our interviews uh, with uh, some of the top American historians on our website, Evidence and Answers, or go to their websites. Truth finds its source in God, and God has established a universal moral law that all men and women are under. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. Truth finds its origin in God. And upon truth, you must build your system of justice. How do you determine right and wrong? Well, if there is no God, if there is no universal moral law, there is no truth. As our culture is preaching today, what's it come down to? I determine what is right. The culture determines what is right. Eventually, it comes down to what? Might makes right. All right? And just degrades into tyranny or moral anarchy. All right? But our founding fathers understood this principle. In order to have a, a moral law, an absolute truth, it's got to be built on its source, God. And upon truth, we build a righteous and just system. And only then can a society have true freedom. The freedom we have is based on a justice system built on truth, built, uh, and truth finds its source in God. Our Declaration of Independence clearly states that. We hold these truths to be what? Self-evident. What's that mean? We all know it. Why? <laughs> because we've been endowed by our Creator with that universal moral law. Right? It says <clears throat> that all men are created equal right? with certain unalienable rights, that among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Creator, creation, God-given moral absolutes. 
That is what our freedom is built upon. All right? You lose that, you lose a free society. I remember <clears throat> listening to Margaret Thatcher, former prime minister of uh, England, and she said, democracies can only succeed and be free if the people are morally good and can govern themselves. If they cannot, then you either have moral anarchy or you have a government that has to take more and more and more and more control of the lives of people. George Washington, our founding father, understood this very well. And in his farewell speech, he gave this warning to America. He said, let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Okay? And when he was speaking of religion there, he was speaking of the Christian faith. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason, and experience, both forbid us to expect that national morality can pre prevail in the exclusion of religious principle. He said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. You can't have freedom unless you have a morally good people who can govern themselves. And you can't have a morally good people unless we have a universal moral law that we all agree to that stands over all of us. Martin Luther said this, the church, what's the church's role in all of this? Well, he said, the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. Okay, he's quoting the great church father Augustine here. <clears throat> he wrote uh, in his sermon, Strength and Love, it must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority there. So the church does not execute justice, but serves as the moral guide and conscience of society. Therefore, the church must be the defender of truth upon which a society can build its just laws upon. So churches need to teach on the biblical role of government to defend truth and from there teach God's universal moral law when it comes to many areas of ethics in our culture today business ethics, medical ethics, environmental ethics. The church needs to be the guide on all of these. Now, finally, what is the duty of the citizen? Paul lays out a few here in verses 6 through 7. He said, for because of this, you also pay taxes. Ooh, everybody groans at that one. But that's part of our duty as believers in Christ. Pay taxes. For the authorities <clears throat> are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owned, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So Paul lays out a few duties there for the believer in Christ. And the first one of our duties is to pay taxes. Second, <clears throat> we pay them because God, those in governmental authorities are ultimately, ultimately, okay, they're servants of the people in a democracy, but ultimately they're the servants of God, and they spend full time governing. So a Christian must give what is due, and Paul says here is another one, not only to submit to their leadership, but respect to whom respect is owed and honor to whom honor is owed. Now, I'm guilty because there are times, and I also am a co-host on a political talk show, Duke Iona's 808 State Update. Uh, <clears throat> I often bring the Christian perspective to political science on that show, but there are times I get really frustrated, and uh, I'm a a, a critic often of what is going on and many times I don't do it in a very respectful manner but we should show respect and honor to those in leadership 
and a Christian citizen should fulfill their duty to the state. Now, in a democracy or a republic, what is the Christian's responsibility in a democracy? Hey, our duty is different in different types of government. But in a democracy, what is our responsibility? Well, we have a few here. One, of course, as Paul states in uh, the book of Timothy, to pray for our government leaders. We should be regularly praying for our president, vice president, our leaders there in Washington, and our state leaders here uh, in the state of Hawaii. Second, in a democracy, one of the things that we owe to the government is our participation eh, and voting. And unfortunately, as I stated, we evangelicals have some of the uh, worst uh, when it comes to participation in voting. But we need to vote and vote intelligently to study and develop biblical values and vote for officials who hold those values. Now, you'll never have a uh, politician, we probably won't have a politician, that agrees with you all the way down the line, unless you yourself run for office, right? But you find the guy that, uh, or uh, female, that agrees with you the most, and you make the best decision you can. Understanding we are in a fallen world, and you vote for the candidate that most, okay, uh, shares your values as much as possible. Some of the key issues for us as believers is looking for candidates who hold to the sanctity of life, right? <clears throat> Those that honor life as sacred okay? and stand against issues such as abortion, euth euthanasia, embryonic stem cell research, and others. Another key issue is to look for uh, those who run for political office who hold to the biblical definition of family, all right? Uh, family is an institution not created by man, created by God. Okay? And any society or culture that redefines marriage, as we are doing now, is a culture that cannot stand. But to vote for candidates that seek to protect the biblical definition of marriage, one man and one woman. Okay? Look for candidates who promote biblical values in other arenas, medicine, in education. Another thing you want to look at, look at their foreign policy, especially when it comes to the nation of Israel. Where do they stand with Israel? The Abrahamic covenant still stands. Genesis 12, I'll bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. Okay, That still stands. Where do we stand with Israel? Okay? Those are some of the things to look for okay? as you study candidates and the issues. We want to vote intelligently. Yeah, I remember talking to a friend at the last election. We got a, one coming up real closely here. Uh, I remember talking to a friend, and, and I said, hey, who are you voting for? And he said, oh. The Japanese guy. I said, why, why the Japanese guy? He goes, oh, that's the smart guy, right? So uh, you got to have a little more substance than that, right? I said, well, what if there's no Japanese guy? He said, oh, then I vote for the Chinese guy. Why vote for the Chinese guy? Well, because he's good with economics, right? Well, uh, okay, you got to be a little more, it's got to be more substance than that, okay? I remember uh, a few years ago, uh, we we're talking about the election and I said, who are you voting for for president? He said, oh, the Republican. I said, why? He goes, well, the other guy went to put a hole. I am voting for that guy. I said, well, okay, you got, got to be a little more. I got to have more substance than that, all right? So <clears throat> we're to vote and vote intelligently. Understand the issues and the candidates out there and to vote intelligently. Next, hey, to raise criticisms against unjust laws, to do it articulately, intelligently, with integrity, with humility, okay, <laughs> and, you know, with love. <clears throat> you know, when we stand before these politicians at the legislature, you know, we should be able to stand before them 
and present our case with integrity and with humility so they'll listen to us. We don't want them to go, oh, no, here come those Christians again. They're going to be screaming and yelling at me again. Well, <clears throat> no, but if we, as uh, Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, with what? Gentleness and humility, we defend and present our case. Gentleness and respect, Peter says, chapter 3, verse 15. And the term respect there, or reverence, is the same reverence we show to God. All right? <clears throat> to present it there and exhaust all legal means possible when there are unjust laws. And we always strive and work towards justice, to holding our nation and our society accountable to God's moral law. Those are some of the duties of the believer okay, in, uh, and their relationship with government, especially in a democracy here in the United States. You know, <clears throat> I get to train leaders in countries all over the world, and, and one of the countries that uh, we have the privilege of going in is the country of Myanmar. And, you know, um, got exciting things going on out there in the country of Myanmar. They were one of the most closed countries in the world, okay? the former country of Burma. Heavily, heavily persecuted uh, the Christians out there in 2013. Finally, under pressure from the rest of the world, they finally declared uh, themselves to be a democracy and started making those changes. You may be following some of those there. But you know, <clears throat> out there, the church has served faithfully. And I think, hey, I'm, not the, I'm not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, but I think you're going to see the church start to explode out there in Myanmar uh, in our generation. Why is that? Well, if you understand... Buddhism, it's a parasitic kind of religion. It takes, okay, but it doesn't give anything in return. Every morning, there's a parade of, you know, Buddhists and their disciples, and people have to give them food and money every morning, okay? And the food and all the money goes to the Buddhist priests who are living in beautiful golden temples. Okay, uh, if you go to the Shwedagon Pagoda, about 30 acres of a temple covered in pure gold. Just incredible sight. 80,000 diamonds, you know, uh, in, in that whole structure. Just an in, in incredible structure. I should have put pictures up there. Anyway, and, and those guys are driving Cadillacs, and they got their cell phones and all, while the neighborhood around them is living in just abject poverty. And what have the Christians been doing out there while living in poverty and being persecuted? They're setting up the orphanages. They're putting up the schools. They're putting up the hospitals. All right? Even though they were a persecuted and still are a persecuted minority. Well, <clears throat> government has come out and said, we don't need any more temples. All right? We don't need any more temples. What do we need? We need schools. We need orphanages. We need hospitals. Well, who's been doing that this whole time? The church. God's church has been out there doing it. And I think as they're living in some, you know, and they haven't been complaining at all. And as they are submitting to the government and being faithful to God's call, they are gaining a hearing in the government. And in fact, the government now is looking at them and granting them more freedom because of the model citizens that they have been faithfully fulfilling and executing their mission there in the land of Myanmar. So I think you're going to see uh, the churches begin to explode in that country. And that's a model, what we need to be as believers, being the best model citizens in our nation, praying for our government leaders, promoting and defending God's truth and his moral law, being a light okay, in our fallen world. And though we will win some battles, we may lose some battles, <clears throat> it's not a call to retreat and isolate ourselves and completely pull out of society. 
You know, some people ask me, they say, well, what's the use when, you know, we win some battles and then the next leader comes and he overturns the law and he overturns everything we fought for and then we go back and, and we try to overturn that and then that gets, what's the use of it all? Well, I think one of the best illustrations comes from J.R. Tolkien's movie, uh, from the movie Lord of the Rings. You remember before that great battle against the forces of evil, the armies of men gathered and Aragorn and his men depart in the night suddenly and nobody knows why. And as the king and his men are looking at Aragorn and his two companions depart, they're saying, why is he leaving? And they say, and the king, and, and they begin to uh, question and say, he's leaving because he knows the battle is hopeless. We cannot win. And the king looks at his men and he says, the battle may be hopeless, but nevertheless, we shall engage the enemy in battle. And that's the call of the Christian, right? While we are here upon this earth, Jesus has called us to be salt and light, not to retreat and run and hide behind our walls, right? But instead to go out there and engage our culture for Christ, to be salt and light, knowing sometimes we're going to win, sometimes we're going to lose. But nevertheless, we don't retreat, right? We engage our culture for Christ and take a stand until the king returns. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word that gives us a guide as to how to be good citizens in our culture and how to be salt and light in the nation where you have placed us today. May we live wisely. May this church and all churches here in this island and throughout the United States who call upon the name of Jesus Christ be an effective witness for your son Jesus Christ while we are here, impacting and influencing our culture as you would have us to do, Lord. And may we be a great uh, influencing power. May the churches in Hawaii uh, act with integrity, defending truth, and promoting your laws. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.